It starts back in 19, well, late 1960s, uh, when I meet a man by the name of Ed Bonilla. Ed Bonilla was a community organizer um, who introduced me to the Chicano movement. I had uh, come out of New York City, where I was born and raised. My family is from Mexico, from Nava, Coahuila, Mexico, in El Valle de Texas. And um, they migrated up to New York in the 1920s. And I was born and raised in New York, Manhattan, the South Bronx. And, um, but my family was puro mexicano, and so they would go back and forth to Texas, to Mexico, and other family members would come up as well. So I migrated out to Los Angeles in the mid 60s. And, uh, got involved with the Chicano movement with Ed Bonilla, who was a community organizer, union organizer. And he introduced me to uh, fellow organizers and to the whole Chicano movement, which is how I became so involved in documenting. And I meet people like uh, Bert Corona, uh, Frank Lopez, Margot Albert, um, Raul Ruiz, Joe Raso, a number of people. I started working with La Raza Magazine as a, a photographer and journalist. I attended UCLA in the film uh, department, theater arts department here in, Los, uh, in uh, UCLA. Back then it was known as Ethno Communications. We broke open the theater arts department, film department. It was a third world multicultural gathering of students that for the first time were into uh, movie filmmaking theater arts uh, back in uh, the late 60s and um, I come to meet David Alfaro Siqueiros in 1971 in Budapest Hungary and it was fate uh, for the times they were changing it was 1971 an era of worldwide turbulence and social unrest the United States was at odds with itself of an unpopular war being fought in far off Vietnam. Student protests, civil rights demonstrations, and assassinations were the rules of the day. Within this setting, as fate would have it, I first came to meet famed Mexican muralist David Alfaro Siqueiros at the World Peace Conference held in Budapest, Hungary. This was an international gathering of representatives voicing party lines over current political issues, and he and I were members of the Mexican and American delegations, respectively. During those troubled times, I was a UCLA film student and a staff photographer for La Raza Magazine, the journalistic voice of the Chicano movement in Los Angeles. I was also the ma magazine's designated speaker at this auspicious assembly. Siqueiros, upon hearing there was a Chicano in attendance, called for an introduction. <laughs> Compañero, cuéntame de este movimiento chicano, and invited me to join him and fellow delegates in conversation, drinks, and laughter that lasted well into the wee hours of la mañana. We were smoking cigarettes and drinking vodka. I got drunk with Siqueiros. <laughs> Orale. <laughs> and we were talking art and revolution, and at least he was. I was in, way over my head. But with every shot of vodka, I got bolder. Estaba joven, flaco, con pelo negro. And so I meet Siqueiros, and I photograph him. He invited me to a lecture that he was giving. And um, as you can see, Siqueiros, uh, his moods would change from moment to moment. And so we're saying goodbye. And uh, they're getting into this little Volkswagen car. His wife, Angelica, turns to me and she says, Luis, como dicen ustedes? Chicana power. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that moment that is captured here. And that moment forever changes me. Te toca, you know? And so your life and your purpose takes a whole other twist, a whole other turn. It's flipped around. And so 
poco por poco, I began to learn more about Siqueiros. I didn't really know who Siqueiros was. I knew he was one of los tres grandes, pero más que eso, I didn't know. I was young, I was uneducated in the arts. But through that contact, I began to learn. Through that contact, I began to participate. Through that contact, I meet people like Frank Lopez and Margot Albert and Bert Corona and a uh, number of people who begin to start making that change in Los Angeles as far as the arts, muralism, and movimiento, participation within a system that we're excluded from. And you begin to see how the arts specifically makes that change and influences that change. As you see around here, and you're surrounded by this history. It took 40 years longer to bring this to you. It's a process. It's a baton passing process. It's a marathon. I'm part of the runner. You all are part of the running. You pass the baton on to each other. And that's what happened to me over all these decades that I've been involved. Consciously, subconsciously, unconsciously, you know, you begin to connect the dots. The punto system that Siqueiros talks about, you start connecting those dots. And how Plaza de la Raza comes to be and how Siqueiros gets connected to Plaza de la Raza is a very interesting story because Plaza de la Raza before it becomes Plaza de la Raza, it's just an abandoned boathouse in Lincoln Heights. They were going to tear it down. They were going to raise it. Until people like Ed Bonilla and other union organizers, a lot of union guys became involved with it. And they took up the challenge of trying to create something there. At first, it wasn't going to be Plaza de la Raza. The idea was to create a restaurant. But they did a study and they said, you're not going to sell a taco there. <laughs> and so they said, they came up with an idea. They said, well, how about making it an art center where people can get together and sell their arts and sort of like El Zócalo in Mexico. And so from that genesis of a seed, the idea of Plaza de la Raza comes to be. And so Plaza de la Raza starts by community activists a bottom-up movement that begins with people like Frank Lopez, Margot Albert, and then you see a number of people here in the background that are involved with creating Plaza de la Raza. And if you've never been there, then go there. It's over in Lincoln Heights in Lincoln Park. And it starts in the late 60s. And that movement that takes place in the late 60s, Frank Lopez, goes down to Mexico and he meets with David Alfaro Siqueiros after Ruben Salazar is killed in 1970. And so this lithograph comes out of that meeting with Siqueiros, who in a sense of solidarity with the Chicano community creates this lithograph. And that lithograph becomes part of that history. There's a art sale that takes place, uh, the Art Association, Dealers Association in La Brea, where they do use the lithograph as a fundraising effort for the creation of Plaza de la Raza that's going to contribute to it. They also begin to speak to Siqueiros about creating and protecting the mural America Tropical at Olvera Street. And that, after they come to inspect it, Josefina Quesada, an artista mexicana who comes to Los Angeles, becomes the go-between between Schiffer Goldman, who initiates Professor Schiffer Goldman, who recently passed away, que descanse en paz. But she makes the breakthrough of talking about Chicano art and the artists of the Americas and Latin American art in general, where it was never a course even taught in the schools. She makes the breakthrough. She initiates the early conservation efforts, along with uh, Jesus Trevino. This is Shifra in the early days of the 70s at the Pacific Palisades mural of uh, 
Mexico Today, Retrato de Mexico Today, which is up in Santa Barbara. And then Jesus Trevino creates the KCET documentary, the first documentary on America Tropical and what it means to the community as the mural begins to reemerge. And so those efforts, he sends up and gives authority to Josefina Quesada and Jaime Mejia to inspect the mural and see what the condition is. And they report that the mural is perdido. It's just abandoned. It's, it's difficult to protect and conserve and uh, do what you can and try to protect it. But he says to them, when Frank Lopez goes down to Mexico to speak to him in regards to Ruben Salazar poster, he says, I will recreate the central figure of America Tropical to scale. And I will donate it to the community of Los Angeles, to the Mexican population, to the Chicano population. And it will be housed at Plaza de la Raza. Once Plaza de la Raza is built, Plaza de la Raza was still a concept. Had didn't take place yet. All the buildings that are there now were not there. Pero he wanted to show that solidarity. And so Plaza, the back and forth correspondence that goes to Siqueiros, we start speaking to him and letters start going back and forth and money is being raised for that creation of this central figure that's to be housed at Plaza. And so the process begins, and Siqueiros is actually constructing and building the central figure of America Tropical to be housed temporarily at another site. And then eventually, when Plaza was ready for it, it would come to Plaza de la Raza. But unfortunately, Siqueiros passes away. He gets ill. He was a chain smoker. Siempre fumando, always had a cigarette. And Dia de los Reyes, January 6th, 1974, Siqueiros passes away. And so this project is never completed. This mural that he was going to recreate and donate never completes. And it's lost in time. Somewhere in Mexico it is, but nobody knows where or nobody is saying. I looked for it and I searched for it and I was hoping to bring it up to the exhibition that we did at the Autry. Pero, no paso. And so, that uh, connection to Siqueiros is very important because when I meet him in 1971, I'm part of the American delegation. It's a World Peace Conference. It's the East Bloc, the Soviet Union version of the United Nations. And it's delegates from throughout the world that are attending. Siqueiros is part of the Mexican delegation. I'm part of the American delegation made up of about 25, 30 people. And one early breakfast morning uh, table is approached and they ask, who's the Chicano? And, por favor, acompáñame. And they take me to the table where Siqueiros is and he stands up, me da un abrazo, siéntate compañero. And, Let's talk. And that's where it begins. And he starts asking me, do you know Frank Lopez? Did you know Ruben Salazar? Did you know Jesus Trevino, Schiffer Goldman? And I'm saying, yes, yes, no, maybe, possibly, yes, no. And so we're hooking up over the next two, three days that uh, him and I are sitting there uh, in the evening talking and drinking and, and uh, having a great time. <laughs> we get up. <laughs> We'd go from the, from the night to the early morning, and the sun would be coming up, and we'd still be tragando y tomando y fumando. <laughs> but uh, that's how it comes to be. So Siqueiros is making those connections with us. Because you've got to remember, he had not been in Los Angeles since 1932. Since 1932, when he first painted America Tropical, and then he had to leave because of the work that he did on America Tropical. Uh, it was too controversial. 
And the authorities denied an extension to his visa. He had a six-month visa. And they denied an extension to it after he painted America Tropical. Yes, do what they had it with him afuera. So he has to leave. And he leaves from the port of San Pedro on a ship called the SS. He leaves on the West Nihilus. The SS West Nihilus, which was a freighter. And that freighter departs from San Pedro. It goes down through the Panama Canal and it goes all the way down to Argentina, where him and his wife, Blanca Luz Brum, an Uruguayan poetess, whom he marries here in Los Angeles five days before the opening of America Tropical in 1932. The mural opens in October 9th, 1932. And the mural will again open Más o menos June or July of next year. We're working on that project, and it's a major project between the city and the Getty, and the funding has, is in place, and construction is going on. So América Tropical will once again open to the public next year, spring. Okay, so we are preparing an exhibition, content, materials, and the whole story of that episode of Siqueiros in Los Angeles. So the connection between Siqueiros and Los Angeles and Plaza de la Raza is a very clear one. It's a very connected one, although very few people know that storyline. Very few people. In fact, the only people that know it are you and me right now. Because the story has not been really told. So I'm sharing with you a piece of Los Angeles history that will become more evident as time goes on. Okay, so these are the dots that I've been connecting over all these decades and putting these pieces together and researching and archiving and speaking to people, los veteranos who are just all passed away now. Margo is gone, Frank Lopez is gone, Ruben of course is gone. There's only a few people left. And so the story lives with a few people, but with bits and pieces. And like any good Sherlock Holmes detective, and student of history, you know you've got to pull those pieces together. And that's what it is. And so whether you're a photographer, a cinematographer, uh, a writer, a cook, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you gather those pieces of information and those pieces of history and you put them together. And so that's what this story is about. This story is about connecting those pieces of history and bringing them together in a very meaningful way. In a very, very meaningful way. This exhibition that you see here is part of that history that at first seemed so random and so disconnected because everybody was doing what they were doing, you know? Whether it was up north or south, some of it was connected, some of it was not connected. Uh, some of it was uh, stored away in people's attics. Some of it was in galleries in shows, uh, some of it took 40 years, 50 years to be pulled together, which is a wonderful thing that is happening right now with all of these exhibitions that are taking place throughout Los Angeles. This exhibition here, I got up in the Oiga, compadre, te hablo más tarde. These images that you see here are part of a collective collective effort, uh, a collective consciousness and subconsciousness that takes place. Um, there's a long, long history. Siqueiros and Plaza de la Raza is just part of that history. Self-help graphics is another history interconnected with Plaza de la Raza. Spark uh, over in Venice with Judy Vaca and uh, Deborah Padilla is another history, also connected. So there's all these interconnecting, you know, uh, efforts between people, directly and indirectly, mutual support in a variety of different ways. And so you've got to start realizing that importance. When you look at this image, 
and you see these people here and you wonder who are they? Well, hopefully what I've just said about Margot or Frank or Ruben or Siqueiros gives you a sense of how this organization, Plaza de la Raza, grew from the ground up. How America Tropical at Olvera Street grew from the ground up by people becoming interested in conserving and preserving our history. Our history meaning not just us as a people, but us as a community, us as Los Angeles, because this is a Los Angeles story. We're all connected, somos primos. We're all connected one way or the other. And so that's the beauty of this story when you're able to see it and tell it. Uh, it's like the archery show that I did with Siqueiros in Los Angeles. And at first there was some resistance to it. And I kept on saying to them, it's a Los Angeles story. Well, you may not like the politics of this particular artist. I may not like your politics, but that doesn't prevent us from discussing and exhibiting and showing each other's points of view. So when you come to understand this as a Los Angeles story, a very unique Los Angeles story, this exhibition here is a Los Angeles story, a very important one. It's not of a, a specific people who separate from it is of a people who are part of. So you always have to look at it in that context. There's a broader sense. There's a micro and there's a macro. And that's what this story is about. So if there's any uh, questions that you might have or, or things you'd like to ask of me, uh, please feel free to do so. Yes, sir. Who commissioned Siqueiros originally to do the uh, Olvera Street uh, mural? The Olvera Street mural was commissioned by a man by the name of F.K. Ferenz. F.K. Ferenz had an art gallery, which was called the Plaza Art Center, in the upper level of the Italian Hall building. Once Cicadus arrives in Los Angeles, uh, he uh, gives an exhibition at the Jake Zeitlin bookstore. Uh, Jake Zeitlin was uh, an, art, an intellectual, uh, social figure within the artist community of Los Angeles in those times of the early 1930s. And Jake Zeitlin is also uh, becomes a lifelong friend and an agent for Cicados who helps to bring uh, the Ruben Salazar poster to existence here in Los Angeles and connects. So F.K. Ferenz, after Cicados does the first mural at Chouinard Art School, which is called Street Meeting, which is immediately whitewashed. Olvera Street, El Paseo de Los Angeles, El Paseo Mexicano de Los Angeles, it had several different titles, was created in 1930. And so in 1932, you have the Olympics arriving in Los Angeles. And so part of the boosterism that was taking place, this Mexican marketplace, the vision of Christine Sterling, the godmother, was to promote it, bring in more tourists, to attract people. Siqueiros just finishes painting his mural at Olvera Street, which is the first of its kind outdoor mural. Content is also um, somewhat uh, offensive to the powers that be because of the union labor interracial mixture of workers and such like that, so they immediately whitewash it. Pero they have this idea to paint this huge mural on the second floor, the upper level of the Italian Hall building, which is 18 feet by 82 feet wide. But who can paint? Press. Siqueiros, this Mexican artist, he just arrived. Let's give him the title Tropical America. What can he do with that? He can't mess that up, you know? Huh? Dancing senoritas, gay caballeros, parrots, palms, huh? So, they know he's a communist. They know he's a socialist. They know he's a labor organizer. So let's contain him with that title. See, Gators takes the challenge. He says, America Tropical. I think I can do something with that. And he does. And he creates 
la América tropical, oprimida y destrozada por los imperialismos. Tropical America, oppressed and destroyed by imperialisms. Meaning that it dates back to all the European powers, colonial powers that came to the Americas. Back to the Españoles, to the English, to the French, to the Dutch, to the Portuguese, to the Americans as the latest imperialist powers in Latin America. That's the mural that Siqueiros creates. That's his condemnation or his interpretation of what is going on in the Americas. Thanks for being here and sharing your uh, knowledge with us. Uh, I was wondering of these politics you just described, how much of this is going to be part of the events uh, next year and uh, you know the um, showing of the mural again. But just the mural or are there any efforts in, in bringing forth these politics, especially that are very relevant today <coughs> with the blatant uh, persecution of Mexican and Latino immigrants in the U.S. right now? The power of the mural in America Tropical is as relevant today as it was in 1932. It speaks very clearly to those continental realities <coughs> that are taking place. The exhibition and the content material that we are working on will reflect that. It will reflect who is Siqueiros? Who is this artist, this soldier, this, this man who arrives in Los Angeles? The time that he arrives in Los Angeles, what was happening in Los Angeles in 1932? What were those times? What was the censorship that took place? What was the whitewash that took place? Why did that take place? Why was the mural abandoned over the next 20, 30 decade, 20, 30 years until it started to reveal itself like a ghost, an apparition that came through that paint that was peeling off? And then those efforts to conserve it began with people like Schiffer Goldman, Jesus Trevino, uh, Josefina Quesada, Jaime Mejia, myself, uh, Jean Bruce Poole. Uh, there's a long line of people that up to the present day that gave that effort to bring this mural to be. It's taken us 40 years. Ground up, top down, we meet, we make it happen. So the story is a very important story. That is a very unique LA story because how it impacts Los Angeles and the whole mural movement. The seed that Siqueiro planted in the womb of Los Angeles, at Olvera Street, represents a dual birth, that of a city and that of an international modern mural movement. We are finally taking pride, we are finally taking hold and possessing that history and presenting. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Can you tell us, I, I know there's been attempts at cleaning the the mural and showing it. Why has it taken so long? What, what was the politics uh, in those days? Uh, the politics in those days was one that the content and the message was too provocative. 1932 in Los Angeles, Los Angeles was a union, anti-union town. Los Angeles was in uh, what they call repatriation what they call now deportations. It was deportations then, it still is, but they gave it a nicer name. The same thing that's happening today began and was initiated in the 1930s after the stock market crash of 1929. You have a similar parallel that is going on today, which is why I say that the mural is relevant to us today as it was in 1932, because it reflects the economic inequities that were taking place, the mass discrimination that was taking place the deportations of Mexicanos, be they U.S. citizens or not, forcing them out by train, by bus, by car, by any means possible, closing them down. If you read the papers and you see what's going on in this country with Mexican immigrant, Central American populations in particular, it's similar to the 1930s. It was a coordinated federal and local regional program 
to drive them out. Drive them being them being Mexicanos in that case because that was a major population. So those are the parallels. Why it is, has it taken so long to get this mural finally? I think they tried in the 80s and the 90s. Oh, you know, they've been trying, we've been trying since late 1960. Schiffer Goldman said it best mm -hmm. that America Tropical suffered dual censorship. The first was the act of whitewashing. The second was the not so benign neglect, bureaucratic government neglect. Couldn't get anywhere. Nobody wanted to touch it. It wasn't until Antonio Villarraigosa came in as first councilman and then as mayor, and you had a progressive city council that finally took the challenge when the Getty said, are we going to do this project or not? Because we've been at this for 20 years and nothing has happened. And when I was asked why, the same question you're asking, my response was a lack of political will and a lack of money. Those two things were overcome. And so it's finally going to happen. And so the deal was made, the monies were placed, and now construction is underway, and that mural will open to the public in the spring of 2012. Does that answer your question? Anyone else? Uh, I have one. I'm sorry to be behind you. Um, does UCLA have an artist in residence program? And if so, um, have we had Latino artists in residence? Do you know the answer to that? I have no answer for you on that. I do not know. You'd have to speak to. Uh, <laughs> well, here, here at the Fowler Museum, we've had several residencies. We've had Latino artists in residence, yes. And I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's more widespread than just what we've done here. So. Thank you. Anyone else? When, when all this is going on uh, with the plaza, is the city behind you? The city at that time Yeah, you finally got the city to start giving support. But because of what was going on in the streets, the massive demonstrations that were taking place, the unrest, the civil unrest that was taking place, and there was nothing civil about the unrest. It was chokes. So out of that kind of turmoil, that kind of confrontation, you then begin to get the city who has to respond and say, we need to do something, however meager the effort might be. And so it, it is out of those initial efforts by these community local and as well from other sources. Margo is married to Eddie Albert. Margo is an actress in her own right. Margo is Mexicana hasta los copetes. <laughs> And she's married to Eddie Albert. So Margo brings in the West Side Hollywood connection. She brings in people like Anthony Quinn, Robert Redford, um, uh, Kirk Douglas, uh, one, a whole list of Hollywood artists who come in to support. Uh, Frank Lopez brings in the unions. The East LA, Casa, and Chicano, and community people start coming together for it. So you have this mass movement that begins to take place. And so that's how Plaza is built, out of those efforts. And then community monies, corporate monies, government monies, and you begin to start learning how to uh, work the levers of philanthropy and foundations and donations and community arts organizations come to be. It's a rare thing. It's not like they have a history. 501c3 community organizations is a new breed. So you have to learn a new language in terms of that creation. How do you govern it? How do you manage it? Plaza de la Raza is multi-arts. It's not a single focus. It's theater, it's dance, it's arts, it's uh, music, it's, it's all of these factors which what becomes the vision of creating a center. And now you have a school there that has been there for the past 25 years where you have hundreds and hundreds of students who come in after school to Plaza de la Raza for classes. Over a hundred classes are taught at Plaza de la Raza. And so you have all these young kids 
from two years old to 85 years old. And it's all community artists who teach classes and give classes. So it's that you give, I give, we give. Adelante, raza. You know, and everybody is raza in the broad sense. Hmm? Do we have a final question from anyone? Final question. Um, so I'm wondering then, um, provided that now there's legislation to establish a national museum of the American Latino, um, and given that that LA has yet to really establish a major Latino art museum, how then do you think that this new museum might uh, uh, affect those efforts, or even just the struggle with um, the other museum that they just opened? Uh, Downtown that is struggling to keep its doors open. How, you know, I'm just wondering what future we can. Well, that's a, that's a question over a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we have some? That's tequila. <laughs> I don't have an answer for you on that. That's a, that's a more of a, that's, that's a ongoing. That's ongoing. Why do you think, though, that, that we haven't been able to establish a, uh, a museum here in, in LA? Uh, I, Again, the same question that was put, money and political will. There is the Museum of Latin American Art in Washington. Oh, right, right, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, in this economy, it, it's, it's, it's difficult just to keep the doors open to small community organizations uh, and even major institutions now that are struggling to keep their doors open. So a startup, as ambitious as creating that kind of an organization is financially very expensive. Not to say that it cannot be done, and at some point it may be done. I mean, they're talking about doing that in Washington, D.C. Uh, with a major Latino arts uh, organization. But I can't really speak more than, more than that to the question. Thank you very much for everyone for coming. I want to share with you all that Luis has four photographs in this exhibition. As you're walking around, I hope you'll have time to enjoy the exhibition a bit more. And they are in the front half of the exhibition. And uh, right, one, by, three by the right, the door as you're walking out, and one is right on the back side of the mural here. And if anyone is inclined, we actually have another fantastic program this evening about. Uh, contemporary artists and spirituality with William Cordova and Amalia Mesa Baines, who I think are walking through here right now, and John Outerbridge as well. That's at 7 o'clock tonight, and we'd love you to come back for that. It's going to be a fantastic program as well. Luis, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. But I'm an American. Do uh -huh. <laughs> you have a card? See, but it's in the, I'll give you one in the lobby. Right. Right. But I've actually had quite a few people.